please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Data. Welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight, Robert. Thank you, Jennifer. So nature has endowed us with our five senses. Uh, and it's through these uh, five canonical senses that we're afforded an understanding uh, of the world around us. Our, our senses allow us to feel a caress, uh, to taste uh, the sharp jolt of acid in an unripe apple, to see the many hues of a sunset, uh, to hear poetry, and of course, to smell uh, the first wisps of smoke coming off a, a newly lit fire. In every way that matters, our senses make the world real. Uh, and yet uh, our senses are woefully incomplete. Evolution has given us senses that capture just a tiny fraction of the sensory information in which we are immersed every day. Indeed, there are animals that live on this very planet that have you know, extremely different senses from the ones that we have. Consider uh, the bat that can hear ultrasonic vocalizations and can use uh, these incredibly high pitches uh, that we just can't hear in order to localize prey. Or the pit viper that actually has a kind of third eye that's capable of seeing heat. This lets the pit viper hunt uh, in total darkness. And so the sensory world that these animals live in is you know, totally dissimilar from the one that we live in. Not only are our senses kind of limited and specific, uh, they're also uh, remarkably inaccurate and noisy. And because of that, our brain is always engaged in this process of guessing, of filling in the blanks, of trying to um, you know, use predictions to figure out what's actually out there. And it's this process that causes illusions like the perception of a black triangle where of course uh, there is none. And so you know, our senses don't uh, give us reality. They tell us a convenient bedtime story that we try to make the best of. My job, as a sensory neurobiologist is to figure out um, how our brain constructs useful fiction from truth in order to allow us to successfully navigate the world around us. Uh, and the distance that separates reality from our perceptions, I think in, imbues all of our senses with a, a kind of mystery. And I'm gonna argue that there's no sense that's more mysterious, uh, both from a philosophical and from a scientific perspective, uh, than our sense of smell, um, which is the subject I'm gonna to talk to you about today. And so I'd like to begin by just describing two of the qualities of our sense of smell that I think make it really mysterious and profound and interesting. I'm then gonna describe uh, just a bit about what we know about how the sense of smell works before turning to, to the main topic for tonight, which is, uh, some of the work that my lab has done and other labs have done recently to try to better understand how the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that's causing the COVID pandemic, uh, actually robs us of our sense of smell and some of the implications of that, um, which I'll get to at the very end. But to begin, let's, let's think about um, kind of these two characteristics I've alluded to that I think makes smell really interesting and special. And I think the first is best illustrated by a video uh, that I've gratuitously stolen from the Planet Ocean series that was um, produced by the BBC. Uh, what you're looking at here is a periwinkle in its natural environment. And when I hit play on this movie, this periwinkle is going to encounter uh, a predator, which in the case of a periwinkle is a megaconch. So here you see the periwinkle and here comes the megaconch. When the periwinkle detects this conch, it's going to generate a series of escape behaviors. You see it turning here, it's going to accelerate. Uh, and uh, at some point, this uh, out of desperation, this periwinkle will avert itself out of its shell and generate this saltatory jumping behavior uh, to try to save its own life. And unfortunately for this particular periwinkle, uh, the conch is uh, just too much and the periwinkle is eventually consumed. So I'm showing you this particular predator-prey interaction because um, folks have studied it. Uh, researchers like Dixon Halliwell have, have studied this, this particular interaction carefully and have discovered that this interaction is mediated by the sense of smell. If they isolated um, the mucus that comes off of these conches, which contain within them odorants that are detectable, small molecules that, that, that can be detected by smell systems. If they take that mucus and they tap it on the antenna of a periwinkle, which is of course how periwinkles smell, uh, then periwinkles generate without any training or prior experience, all of those behaviors you just saw, they'll turn away, they'll begin to accelerate, they'll try to escape. 
So what does that tell us? It tells us that evolution has built into the periwinkle genome a smell detector that's capable of detecting the smells that come off conscious, uh, and that it's also built a nervous system for the periwinkle that hooks up those smell detectors specifically to circuits uh, for fleeing and for escape. In other words, periwinkles are born knowing what conscious smell like. Conscious to a periwinkle smell like impending death, and they behave accordingly. From, from this perspective, um, smell is really primal. And it, it turns out that for most animals, uh, smell is the most important sense. Uh, and that's because it plays this kind of primal role in allowing animals to solve their existential problems of existence day on day. And the smell is used for most animals to find food, uh, as I just mentioned, to avoid predators, and of course, to find uh, appropriate mates. But, but in humans, smell you know, isn't, isn't just primal. Smell feels sublime and profound and aesthetic. We're all aware of the story of Proust uh, and his Madeleine uh, and how the scent of that cookie was capable of teleporting Proust uh, back in time and, and, and through space to his childhood, to memories of home and to memories of safety. And I think all of us have smell memories that are similar, that, that take us to different places in different times uh, that are uh, salient or profound or important and emotionally res resonant to us. Some of these exper um, experiences I'd argue are, are even shared. Um, I think a great example of this is the smell of petrichor. I think many of you probably aren't familiar with the term petrichor, but, but I think you're all familiar with the experience. Petrichor uh, is uh, the word for the, the smell that comes off of the ground uh, when it encounters new rain. Uh, and we as scientists know that, that petrichor is actually caused by the release from the dirt of a chemical, an odorant called geosmin which is actually made by bacteria that live in the soil and which, and which is aerosolized by the imposition of moisture and, and rain. But when we experience petrichor, of course, it's so much more than just the smell of geosmin. Um, petrichor to us is, you know, it smells of hope. It smells of renewal. Uh, it smells of spring. And so for me, the reason why smell is so interesting and so fascinating is because it's clear that our brain through one olfactory system is somehow simultaneously solving these primal problems of existence, right? Enabling most animals to survive. Uh, while in us, that, that, same, that very same system en uh, enables us to tap into our deepest memories uh, and, and really profound emotions. Uh, so what do we know about how the olfactory system actually works uh, and how uh, we're able to interact uh, with smells in the world. So I'll just remind everyone that, that smells are actually collections of small molecules or chemicals that come off of odor objects in the world, like as shown here, um, off of a flower. And as we breathe or as we sniff, these small molecules are introduced into our nasal cavity. And our nasal cavity is special because it houses within it uh, a special tissue called the olfactory epithelium. I'm gonna be talking a lot about the olfactory epithelium tonight. Um, but for now, I'll tell you that the olfactory epithelium contains within it uh, a cell type called a neuron. Neurons are these are information processing units that help our brains process information for us to think and perceive. And it turns out there are neurons that are outside of our brain as well. And there's a collection of them that live inside of our nose, which are called olfactory sensory neurons. And these neurons are specialized to detect odors in the world. And when they encounter odors, you know, in your nose, these neurons uh, transform the presence of odors into electrical activity. These neurons alert the brain to the presence of these odors because these neurons actually elaborate a kind of wiring uh, and, these wire, and these little neuronal, wi this neuronal wiring, uh, are, these are referred to as axons and these little bits of wire actually puncture the little bone that sits at the base of your skull here called the cribriform plate. There are little holes in this bone and then these axons run through this little bone. And then these axons terminate here in this yellow structure at the base of your brain called the olfactory bulb, which is the first way station for uh, odor processing in your brain. And then this information is sent to a wide variety of brain areas that somehow collaborate to generate odor-driven behaviors like approach to something delicious or avoidance of a potential predator. Uh, and to generate the kind of unitary percepts we all associate with smells like uh, the smell of a jasmine or the smell of uh, a cup of coffee in the morning.
Now, my lab does work on human olfaction, but it primarily studies olfaction by studying the mouse olfactory system. And we do this for two reasons. The first is that the mouse olfactory system in, in most meaningful respects is uh, identical anatomically and functionally uh, to the human olfactory system in terms of its organization and the strategies that the mouse olfactory system uses to interact with odors. Uh, but the other reason um, is that you know, for mice, uh, like for most other animals, smell is an incredibly important sense. Uh, if you make a mouse that's genetically defective in its sense of smell, uh, that mouse, mouse will die within hours to, to a day after birth because it can't uh, obtain mother's milk, right? Smell is known to be important for, for mice to find appropriate mates, for mice to find food, for mice to avoid predators. It's fundamental to the existence of a mouse. And so if you're interested in how brains process sensory information and transform that information into action or perception, a mouse is a great place to look. So here is a, a photomicrograph um, of the mouse olfactory epithelium, okay? Uh, which is of course housed inside the mouse's nose. This bone here is that cribriform plate that has little holes. And this tissue here is the olfactory epithelium that's filled with those olfactory sensory neurons. Let's in cartoon form, just zoom into this epithelium so I can tell you a little bit about uh, the cells that live within it. So here again is a kind of zoom in, zoom in of this tissue. We see the bone up here. We see the olfactory epithelium here. And we see these olfactory receptor cells, which also uh, go by the name olfactory sensory neurons because they're neurons, like the neurons in your brain. And you can see that these neurons actually elaborate structures that look like little fingers that are known as cilia that actually are exposed to the air that flows into your nose, as you can see here. These little cilia or fingers express specialized molecular receptors called odorant receptors, uh, whose job it is to detect odors. And when these receptors interact with odors, um, they cause a change in the neuron in which they're expressed that causes an electrical signal to fire. And this electrical signal is propagated up this axon through the bone at the base of your skull. Uh, and as I mentioned before, into your brain. And you can think about these odor receptors as being kind of like locks um, and these odor molecules as being kind of like keys. And when uh, a lock finds its appropriate key, but the lock is turned and that particular neuron fires and tells the brain that there's an odor that it has just detected. Information, as I mentioned before, is sent from the olfactory epithelium to, to a structure in the brain called the olfactory bulb. What you're looking at here is actually a flattened view of the mouse brain. And we're looking specifically at the, the, the part of the brain that's responsible for processing odors. So here in this image is uh, the olfactory bulb, which is thought to um, actually organize olfactory information into a bunch of individual information channels. And that's supposed to help with odor processing. Uh, and then information is sent from the olfactory bulb to multiple higher brain regions, as I mentioned before. And these include the cortex uh, or the olfactory cortex or the piriform cortex. Those are all synonyms for the same structure. Uh, and the cortex is thought to allow the brain to identify what odor you're smelling, to tell odors apart from each other, uh, and to understand what, odor, what categories different odors belong to. Information is also sent directly from the olfactory bulb to the hippocampus. Many of you may be familiar with the hippocampus. It's a key site in both the mouse brain and the human brain because it's responsible for learning and memory. And information also goes directly from the olfactory bulb to the amygdala, another structure many of you may be familiar with. It's a, it's a, uh, a locus in the brain thought to play a key role in mediating um, emotions and feelings. And so the thing I really want you to appreciate from this slide is that there's this incredibly intimate relationship anatomically between smells in the outside world and structures in your brain that are responsible uh, for learning and memory. And this uh, potentially explains the intimate association that we as humans have between smells and memories uh, and emotions. And I'll just mention by way of contrast, that this is very different from the way that information is processed by the other four senses. Uh, those, the other four senses, information takes quite a roundabout kind of uh, route through your brain before ending up in your hippocampus or in your amygdala. Here in the olfactory system, it's like evolution designed the system to mainline information about smells in the outside world straight to these key centers in your brain to drive memory and to drive emotion. 
So uh, despite the fact that we have this kind of layout of the olfactory system, we actually know very little still about how the olfactory system actually works. Uh, just about 30 years ago, Linda Buck and Richard Axel cloned, they identified the molecular odor receptors out here in the nose that are responsible for detecting odorants, uh, a landmark discovery that won them the Nobel Prize. Uh, and in the 30 years since then, there's been a flurry of work by many, many labs trying to understand how these different parts of the brain organize information about odors in order to ultimately allow the brain to generate odor perception and odor related behaviors. Um, I'll just, for the sake of giving you a flavor of the type of basic science that folks are doing, briefly in the next few slides, just tell you about one experiment that my lab published last year uh, in which we were trying to understand what seems like a very simple thing about the olfactory system that we probably should have already known, but, but, but actually didn't. So I think all of us in our common experience uh, with smells uh, would say that lemons smell similar to limes. And I think we'd all agree for the most part that lemons smell really different from pizza. Uh, but why is that? Why do we all agree that lemons and limes belong to some smell category that we would call citrus? And that citrus category is super different from the pizza category. Um, you know, one hypothesis is that the way the brain organizes smells uh, yields the relationships that, those od that odors have perceptually. And so from that perspective, you might imagine that the pattern of neural activity here in the olfactory cortex, where information, where odors are, are, are uh, identified and, and told apart, maybe the pattern of electrical activity for lemon and for lime actually is very similar. Um, and that might um, you know, provide an explanation for why lemon and lime actually smell perceptually very similar. Maybe lemon and pizza are, elicit very different patterns of electrical activity here in cortex. And that might explain why lemons and, and, and pizza smell very different. Uh, no one had actually tested that, that question directly. And, and so to, to, test, to test that hypothesis, um, Stan Paschkowski in my lab um, developed a system that allows us in an awake and breathing animal to actually visualize patterns of neural activity at the single cell level in the cortex of a mouse while we let that mouse sniff various odors. And here on the left, you're looking at a view through Stan's microscope. Uh, here you see a bunch of these little white dots. Each white dot is an actual neuron, an information processing unit in the piriform cortex. And through the magic of genetics, we have introduced into each one of these little neurons a dye that glows or fluoresces uh, whenever the cell is active. And so, so you see these cells kind of flickering on and off. On the upper left, you'll notice that occasionally there's a colored square. And when that colored square flashes, we're giving the animal one of these odorants that's described here, one of these chemical odorants to sniff that's described here below. And if you just watch this movie, I think you'll quickly appreciate that each different odor actually activates a different pattern of neural activity here in the olfactory cortex. And by doing this experiment with many different odorants uh, and doing quite a bit of math, Stan was able to show that indeed the um, pattern of activity elicited by chemically similar odors like lemon and lime appear to be similar uh, in the cortex. And that might suggest why lemon and lime are perceived as being related odors. And as you might predict, lemon and pizza um, elicit different patterns of activity here in the cortex. And that might explain why lemon and pizza smell different. Uh, that's important and fundamental, but it's not very surprising. But what was surprising was what happened when Stan did what we thought was a very silly experiment, which was just to expose the mouse to lemon and pizza at the same time passively, just a bunch, just in the mouse's cage, just let it experience lemon and pizza all at once. And when we did that and then looked back in the brain afterwards to see what happened. It turned out that the pattern of activity associated with lemon became more pizza-like and the pattern of activity associated with pizza became more lemon-like. And when we asked the mouse now to tell apart lemon and pizza, it kind of confused the two into one object, like a lemony pizza. And that suggests something that I think is pretty profound, which is that our own everyday experience appears to customize the way our brain processes information about smells. And that might explain why smell to us, um, on the one hand, feels like a common experience. We all agree that lemons and limes belong to the citrus family. But on the other hand, feels really personal and intimate uh, and individualized. 
So uh, this is just you know, one example of, of one of the basic things that, that our lab and many other labs are learning about how the sense of smell works, how information about odors is encoded in the brain and how that might be trans translated in some way into perception. Uh, we have a huge amount of distance to go. There are many, many basic questions about olfaction. We simply do not understand at this point, uh, but the urgency in answering these questions, I, I would say, has really been brought to the fore by um, our recent experience uh, uh, in the current pandemic. Uh, um, and what we've learned about the relationship between um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, and our sense of smell. You know, I remember, um, you know, when the virus, uh, we first started learning about the virus, you know, now last February, um, it was terrifying, of course, it was clear that it, that it was gonna profoundly affect all of our lives. And it was also strange um, in the sense that um, some of the symptoms that people were reporting were really, really weird, including uh, the kind of anecdotal reports we were hearing back then about people losing their sense of smell. We now know, you know, with the fullness of hindsight that actually loss of the sense of smell is the main neurological symptom associated with COVID, with being infected with SARS-CoV-2. Um, it's certainly true that more than half of patients have a loss of the sense of smell after they're infected with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and kind of recent studies suggest when you do kind of careful quantitative measurements of patients' sense of smell, that as many as 80, 90, even 100% of patients are gonna have some change in their sense of smell when, when they're infected with SARS-CoV-2. And, uh, you know, as I'm sure most of you know, it's really strange for patients to, or people just to suddenly lose their sense of smell. Uh, and because of that, today in this world, uh, if you um, suddenly lose your sense of smell, it's highly likely that the reason you lost your sense of smell uh, was because you've been recently infected with SARS-CoV-2. Because of that, the CDC and the WHO and many other medical organizations have included the loss of the sense of smell uh, on the list of symptoms that, are, that, are, that, that indicate that you might require screening for infection uh, with, um, you know, for, the, for infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. As an aside, I want to mention that you know, we also know that um, people who are infected with the, the virus have changes in their sense of taste and changes in their sense of chemesthesis. Chemesthesis is a special sense that allows us to taste the hot and chili peppers, the cool and menthol. Um, and both of these uh, senses, taste and chemesthesis, seem to be affected by SARS-CoV-2 independent of our sense of smell. We don't really understand how that's happening, so I'm going to not talk about those two senses for this talk. So, you know, once we started to notice that um, COVID-19 uh, was causing people to lose their sense of smell, we also noticed that, like, the pattern of um, pathophysiology for the loss of sense of smell was really weird. So, you know, you and I and everyone has, has had a cold before, and, and often when we get a cold, we lose our sense of smell. And the reason we lose our sense of smell is pretty simple, right? Our noses become inflamed, they become runny, they become stuffed. So odors can't get back to our olfactory epithelium, so we can't smell smells. And so all this inflammation that probably affects the function of our olfactory epithelia as well. Um, and then we get better, right? And um, the, the obstruction clears and the inflammation goes away and we get our sense of smell back right away. And when you're infected with SARS-CoV-2, that's not what happens. Often people lose their sense of smell and they have no runny nose, no stuffy nose, no blockage that they can detect of any kind, and certainly no gross inflammation. In fact, often um, loss of the sense of smell is the only symptom that someone with uh, a COVID infection actually has. It can be the only symptom they have. Uh, and the other really weird thing is that um, for most patients, they kind of lose their sense of smell like a light switch going off. Um, and all of this is totally different from what any of us have experienced with the way that other viruses uh, cause changes in the sense of smell. Uh, the other really unusual thing um, is shown here in this graph on the left, uh, which is the kind of pattern of recovery of people after they've lost their sense of smell. Uh, so we know now, and this is kind of older data, but it's representative of, of what we know now, uh, that if you get COVID and then you lose your sense of smell, it's very likely that you'll get it back within two to six weeks. Maybe 90% of people recover um, their sense of smell completely and, and quickly kind of on that time frame. But look over here on the right side of this the graph, look at this tail. 
it's clear that there's a subset of people that actually take much longer to recover. Uh, maybe five to 10% of people um, have anosmia or the loss of a sense of smell that lasts more than six months. And it's clear that there are patients who were infected, you know, last March, right? You know, a year and a half ago, that still haven't recovered or fully recovered their sense of smell. And so there's these kind of two categories of patients. Uh, you know, the first category of people, you know, lose their sense of smell and then recover it pretty quickly. And another um, set of patients that, that in which their sense of smell seems to be much more profoundly damaged. It takes a lot longer to recover. And so, you know, when the, the pandemic hit and we began to realize that the virus was attacking our sense of smell, you know, my lab and other labs began thinking about how the virus might actually affect our sense of smell. And we realized that, you know, whatever was going on, the virus would have to somehow globally shut off our sense of smell, right? And then in most patients, it would have to be rapidly reversible. Whatever that insult was would have to be able to be, you know, kind of recovered very quickly. But we'd have to also be able to explain why there's this subset of patients in which that pattern doesn't hold and in which anosmia persists for months or even years. Okay, so, so um, how can we think about how the virus actually attacks our sense of smell? Well, when, when my lab first started thinking about this at the very beginning of, of the pandemic, um, you know, um, the folks in my lab who, who began really thinking about this carefully, and that includes David Brand, who's an incredible graduate student in my lab, and two postdocs, Tatsuya Tsukahara and Caleb Weinreb, um, they thought that they, they basically took their inspiration from work that had been done uh, with similar viruses and, and trying to understand how they attack other organ systems like the lung, or the kidney or the heart. Um, and, they, and, they, and they thought about the basic biology of SARS-CoV-2. So SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus, which means that it has a crown. Uh, and the crown that it has uh, is um, this kind of crown of spike proteins, uh, which kind of coat the entire exterior surface of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And these spike proteins are important because they enable the virus to bind to and enter human cells. And the virus cannot enter all human cells. It can only enter and infect specific human cells. And the cells it can infect express a specific receptor for this spike protein called the ACE2 protein. And it's known in, in, in other systems like in the lung that the cells that express the ACE2 protein are precisely those cells in your lung that get infected by SARS-CoV-2. And because of that, David and, and Tatsuya and, and Caleb reason that if they could figure out which cells in your nose express ACE2, they might be able to figure out which cells in your nose are getting infected by the virus. And that might allow them to hypothesize a mechanism that would explain why people when they're infected with the virus lose their sense of smell. So uh, what are the cells uh, in the olfactory epithelium that could potentially be infected uh, by uh, the virus. So as I mentioned before, uh, of course, your olfactory epithelium has these olfactory sensory neurons that are responsible themselves for uh, detecting odors and sending information about odors they detect uh, in your nose uh, up into your brain. And these are great candidates uh, for being cells that are somehow influenced by the virus because these are the cells that actually are responsible for detecting smells. But there are two other key cell types uh, in your olfactory epithelium that are responsible for supporting the function of your olfactory sensory neurons. The first are these so-called sustentacular cells, and these cells provide support for olfactory sensory neurons in multiple different ways. They uh, are intercalated between the olfactory sensory neurons, and so they kind of physically prop these olfactory sensory neurons up. They also effectively feed the olfactory sensory neurons uh, glucose and other bioenergetic molecules. And I think most importantly, these sustentacular cells also secrete ions that keep the electrical balance um, of the fluids in which these olfactory sensory neurons are bathed correct. And that ion balance is really important because that's what allows these cells to generate electrical currents and communicate with the brain. In addition to these kind of sustentacular cells, which are supporting the olfactory sensory neurons, you'll also notice here that there, there's a set of stem cells at the base of the epithelium. 
So these stem cells are super important, even in us, uh, you know, those of us who aren't infected with the virus, and they're in, important for our olfactory function um, as part of our day-to-day -day lives. And that's because as we breathe in and out of our noses, we, we carry into our noses all sorts of garbage, right? Cigarette smoke and toxins and particles and, and other kinds of viruses and bacteria. And all that gunk and that toxic crud uh, attacks this tissue and degrades it over time, just normal wear and tear. And so what allows this tissue to continue to function throughout our lifetime is the fact that there are these stem cells at the bottom of the olfactory epithelium that are continuously regenerating both these sustentacular cells and these olfactory sensory neurons. And I wanna just mention that when a new olfactory sensory neuron is made and integrated into the olfactory epithelium, first it's kind of cell body is made uh, and, and it adopts the correct position, but then it elaborates this axon. And over time, this axon has to find its way through this bone at the base of your skull, all the way up into your brain until it finds the correct target in the brain in the olfactory bulb um, to make a connection, to communicate with the brain. And that all takes time. And I'll come back to that point in just a few minutes. Uh, in the olfactory bulb in your brain, of course, that tissue also has a bunch of different cell types, um, which for our purposes aren't that interesting because I'm only gonna talk about that briefly. But those cell types include neurons that process information, includes glial cells that act as kind of glue to support the tissue, and it includes vasculature or, or, or different kinds of cells that allow blood to be delivered to the olfactory bulb so that this tissue can be oxygenated and function properly. Okay, so we have all these different cell types in the olfactory epithelium um, and in the olfactory bulb. And we wanna ask, I'll just remind you, you know, which of these specific cells actually expresses the receptor for SARS-CoV-2, which of these cells expresses ACE2? How are we gonna go about figuring that out? Well, we took advantage of a relatively newly developed technology called single cell sequencing. And in single cell sequencing, you take a tissue like the olfactory epithelium, you break it up into its constituent cells. Okay, so you can, this is just a cartoon, but you can see three different cell types that might live in your olfactory epithelium. And then through advanced genomic technologies, uh, you can identify all of the different genes that are expressed by these different cells. And, and by looking at which different genes are expressed by each individual cell, we can identify the type of cell it is. I can tell whether this is a neuron or a sustentacular cell or a stem cell. And I can also ask, which one of these cells expresses that critical ACE2 gene, which is the receptor for SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so we got some, um, some um, data, some single cell sequencing data from our collaborator, Brad Goldstein. Uh, and we asked which of these cells in the human olfactory epithelium uh, actually express the ACE2 receptor and therefore are potentially attackable directly by the virus. Pay attention uh, in this graph just to the the two columns that have the arrows here and pay attention just to the red bars. In red, we're gonna plot out the expression of the ACE2 gene in these two cell types that are marked with the arrows. The first cell type is in olfactory sensory neurons, okay? Which are the cells that I would have predicted are the ones that express ACE2 because these are the key cells that actually detect odors. And what you can see is that these cells don't actually express any ACE2. But if you look over here at the sustentacular cells, they express a lot of ACE2, as do these HBCs, which is another name for stem cells. So the support cells in the epithelium, the cystentacular cells and the stem cells seem to express the ACE2 gene, but the olfactory sensory neurons do not. We can also uh, actually take little bits uh, of human olfactory epithelial tissue. This is an experiment that was actually done by Brad and stain it uh, with antibodies directed against the ACE2 protein, and that will color the cells that express ACE2 green. Here you're looking at actual human olfactory epithelium, okay? This blue layer uh, of uh, cells are actually olfactory sensory neurons. This thin layer of red cells down here are the stem cells that live at the base of the epithelium. Uh, and these cells over here are the sustentacular cells. And you can see the only cell type in the human epithelium that turns green, the only two cell types are the sustentacular cells and the stem cells, not the neurons. And these data together suggest that the key cell types in your nose that are infected by the virus are the support cells rather than what we expected, which are the neurons. The neurons appear not to be directly infected by the virus. Since our kind of initial publication of this, these data and, and this hypothesis, this has been followed up by uh, studies by another by a number of other groups trying to directly validate this this hypothesis, and indeed um, the, uh, the this hypothesis 
uh, in the bulk of the data that's been published to date uh, appears to be true. Here uh, in red, we're gonna look at a, at a hamster olfactory epithelium. And in red, we're staining cells that have actually been infected by SARS-CoV-2. So they, they introduced the SARS-CoV-2 virus into the nose of the hamster and asked which cells in the epithelium turn red, which cells are infectable. And you'll have to take my word for it, these cells that are stained red here in the epithelium, these are all sustentacular cells or support cells. Recently in the journal Cell, um, Peter Momberts and his colleagues recently got human autopsy tissue of patients that had, had died of COVID. Uh, and they stained their olfactory epithelia with antibodies that could identify which cells were infected with SARS. And these red cells here, again, you'll have to take my word for it, these aren't neurons. They are instead the support cells that provide the critical support to neurons. And all these data together lead us to a kind of interesting model. And the model is that um, the, the primary target for infection by this virus in your nose isn't the neuron, but instead is the adjacent support cell, is the adjacent sustentacular cell. And maybe the way that sustentacular cell um, dysfunction causes a transient loss of your sense of smell is by maybe um, the temporary loss of the sustentacular cell's ability to say maintain the appropriate ion balance around olfactory sensory neurons that might prevent them from generating the appropriate electrical currents, thereby denying them the ability to communicate with the brain. Another idea uh, that has some evidence to support it is that maybe infection of sustentacular cells causes a little bit of local inflammation and inflammatory cytokines then shut down the ability of olfactory sensory neurons to communicate with the brain. In either case, in either of these models, um, you know, we think that kind of modest infection of sustentacular cells doesn't actually damage the olfactory epithelium itself. And so when this infection clears, because there's no actual physical damage to the epithelium, the epithelium can just recover. And again, like a light switch turning back on, you can suddenly recover your sense of smell. And so this model explains, you know, how uh, infection of sustentacular cells might lead to transient loss of the sense of smell. Uh, what about um, the more permanent loss of sense of smell that, that occurs in five to 10% of patients? Well, maybe in that case, uh, um, profound infection uh, of sustentacular cells can lead to sustentacular cell death. We know from various other viruses that that can happen. And we know that when sustentacular cells die, they end up taking the adjacent olfactory sensory neurons with them. And with that, when that happens, it's up to these stem cells right at the base of your epithelium to regenerate this tissue. And that process can of course take months, which might explain the prolonged anosmia that, that, that a subset of patients experience. And, and that process might even be delayed further because as I mentioned before, it's possible that these stem cells themselves because they express the ACE2 receptor, it's possible these stem cells are also being targeted by the virus. And so it could be true that in cases of really profound infection, it takes a long time, maybe even years, uh, for the tissue to repair itself uh, and to recover. And so these, these are the current, this is our current thinking about how smell affects the cells in your nose. It's also worth mentioning uh, how uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus might affect your brain. This is a bit of human tissue and it's just meant to highlight for you um, the fact that there's this olfactory epithelium in your nose and the cells, the olfactory sensory neurons in this epithelium have these axons, this wiring that talks to the brain and this wiring traverses through this bone that's at the base of your skull called the cribriform plate. And what this practically means is the base of your skull has a bunch of holes in it. Uh, and there's a worry that maybe the, the virus can be incubated in your olfactory epithelium, cross through these holes at the base of your skull, infect your olfactory bulb, and from there infect the rest of your brain. And so uh, to address the, the possibility that this is what's happening, um, we, uh, along with our colleagues, asked which cells in the olfactory bulb actually express ACE2. We wondered whether neurons in your olfactory bulb might express ACE2, because if they did, then maybe the virus can hop from your nose into your brain and infect neural circuits. And so we did some single cell sequencing, just like I showed you before. This is a graph, just like I showed you before. On the y-axis is how much a given cell type expresses ACE2. And you see all these cells on the left, all these cells are the glia and the neurons that are really you know, responsible for information processing uh, in the olfactory bulb, and none of these cells express appreciable levels of ACE2. The only cells that really express a lot of ACE2 are cells that make up your vasculature, that line your blood vessels. And if we do the same experiment that I showed you before in the nose, and we stain 
for ACE2 to try to look at the actual tissue and see what cells are actually expressing the ACE2 protein. You can see here in green, all of these, uh, these little vessels, these are all cells that line blood vessels and, the, and these cells help uh, provide, um, you know, deliver blood and provide oxygen to the olfactory bulb. But the neurons that make up the vast majority of the olfactory bulb don't seem to express ACE2. And that suggests um, that neurons in your olfactory bulb are not directly infected by the virus, but it's possible that the virus could infect uh, the vasculature in your olfactory bulb. And that, that could contribute in some way um, to the development of the loss of smell or the, or, or the development of anosmia. And I'll just mention now that these results that we're seeing here for the olfactory bulb in which um, neurons do not appear to express ACE2 and therefore do not appear to be infectable. Um, this question has been investigated by many other investigators looking at other regions of the brain. And this general pattern appears to be true elsewhere in the brain true, elsewhere in the brain as well. It appears that the vast brain vasculature appears highly infectable by the virus, but the actual neural circuits out of which our brain you know, processes information, those cells, those neurons don't appear to really express ACE2 and, and therefore are unlikely under most circumstances to be directly infected by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so the main takeaways here are, are first that, you know, in the nose um, and, and probably also in the brain, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is not infecting neurons directly, which I would argue is a, is a kind of weird form of good news. Uh, instead, it appears that um, the virus seems to attack support cells and non-neuronal cells. Um, and that through indirect mechanisms um, like, um, changing the ionic balance of um, the salts that are in your mucus or by causing inflammation um, or even by causing uh, you know, profound damage to the olfactory epithelium and, and olfactory sensory neuron cell death. Indirectly, um, you know, the virus affects uh, your ability to, to detect odors. And, and these two different modes uh, of, of uh, um, recovery that, that patients have uh, from SARS-CoV-2 in terms of restoring their ability to detect odors might reflect different ways in which sesentacular cells recover from infection. Uh, and finally, it appears that you know, brain tissue relevant to olfaction, especially the olfactory bulb, you know, the neurons in that tissue probably aren't being directly attacked by the virus, but, it, but it's definitely possible that either directly or indirectly, the vascular cells that really support the olfactory bulb and other brain tissues um, can get affected. I'm sure many of you have heard of long COVID, um, which is this kind of phenomenon in which people have lingering COVID symptoms. And, and one of the hallmark symptoms of long COVID is you know, a little bit of brain fog. And it's clear that the virus uh, can affect brain function, it can, can, can affect neural circuit function. And I think our results and the results of others suggest that, that, that the ability of the virus to affect brain, brain function probably isn't due to a direct infection of neurons, but, but likely is a consequence of, of the virus being able to cause diffuse inflammation, which can go on to affect brain circuits, uh, possibly because the virus can infect the vasculature inside the brain. Finally, I wanna remind you of a slide that I showed you kind of near the beginning of this talk. I, I told you that the olfactory system was unusual because there's this really intimate interrelationship anatomically uh, between smells and the outside world and centers in your brain responsible for memory and especially for emotion. Uh, and, and, you know, this, we think, uh, allows smells to have this really kind of profound and sublime effect on our own emotional state. You know, despite the fact that we think as humans of, of smell as being, you know, primarily an aesthetic sense, uh, there's a large literature, a large psychological literature that suggests that actually our ongoing day-to-day -day interactions with smells in our environment really helps center us in the world uh, and plays, and therefore smell plays a really important role in our day-to-day -day sense of well-being. Uh, and this pandemic has, has, has caused something that as far as I know has never uh, happened before in the history of mankind, which is that now all of a sudden across the globe, we have you know, tens of millions of people here in the United States is probably as many as a million people who have lost their sense of smell and lost it for a prolonged period of time. And setting aside the fact that that has significant consequences for, for individuals who've lost their sense of smell in terms of safety, or you can't smell smoke um, or natural gas, uh, and it has real profound consequences for nutrition. I, th I think it's really important to note that often patients who lose their sense of smell feel really emotionally disconnected uh, from the world. It's as if they're not quite centered where they were before. I myself um, 
when I was in my 20s, lost my sense of smell as a, as a consequence of chemotherapy. And I can tell you it's an incredibly disjointing thing. And it's well defined in the clinical literature that folks that um, suddenly lose their sense of smell, like people who've had car accidents and have had trauma to their nose, but those folks were at substantial risk of going on to develop depression. And you know, anecdotally, it's quite clear in the community that many of the people um, who have lost their sense of smell for longer periods of time uh, feel adrift uh, and are, are definitely at risk of developing neuropsychiatric disorders. And so I think one of the uh, perhaps less well understood and, and not, not very well discussed, but, but really important consequences of this pandemic is an appreciation of the importance of our sense of smell for our emotional well-being, um, and I think we're going to have to really pay attention to the consequences of uh, of the pandemic in terms of people's psychological state, you know, going forward as we deal with the fallout of this pandemic, uh, and hopefully we will be prepared um, to deal with um, the psychological consequences of the pandemic in the near future and and prepare ourselves, you know, for the next pandemic. And with that, I'll just end. I just want to mention one one last thing about kind of the science that I told you here at the end, you know, uh, my lab and, and, and the lab of all, of all of my colleagues in the, in fact, of, in the olfactory community uh, were really rocked by the pandemic. You know, science across the globe on every problem other than COVID basically stopped last spring as all of us dealt with all the restrictions and limitations that, that came with, with working during a pandemic. Um, and working under those kinds of constraints to try to solve an important problem like how the virus attacks um, the sense of smell really required a lot of creativity. And one of the things that ended up being true is that my lab uh, had some data kind of on our hard drives that kind of gave us a little bit of the puzzle. Uh, but it was clear that as we talked to our friends that across the globe, you know, that many people had data that were relevant to this problem. Um, but, but only through working together under these kinds of unusual circumstances, we're able to put all the data together uh, to make a complete story and to gain some sort of uh, potential understanding. Uh, and so the work that I talked to you about today was done in my lab that was led by you know, David and Tatsu and Caleb, who I've mentioned, but it was part of really an international consortium, kind of a, a band of people who got together, you know, that, that are distributed across the globe, trying to make the best of this, you know, really horrible situation. And, and, and the participants include the lab of John Nye. John's currently the head of the U.S. Brain Initiative. Matt Grubb, who's at King's College in London. Brad Goldstein and Hiro Matsunami, who are both at Duke. And Darren Logan, who is, who is at UCLA and now is at Mars in England. Uh, and only through this, this kind of broad range of collaboration were we able to come up with the science that we did under the circumstances. And I think it, it perhaps is one of the few silver linings of this pandemic that I think we as scientists are learning new ways to interact with each other to solve important problems. And hopefully that'll be one thing that sticks uh, after this pandemic is long behind us. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to answering any of your questions.